Okay, so once again, I'm Matt Skederberg, CEO of Coreform. Greg Vernon, Director of Product Management, will be walking us through the item wizard, which makes hex meshing just a little bit easier in Coreform Qubit. So today we'll be introducing Coreform Qubit, uh, in introducing hex meshing, then we'll give a demo of how to use the item wizard on a, on a few parts and then have a Q&A. So whenever I'm coming into a new subject, it's always nice to know like those that are well-versed in the subject, how, how do they feel about it? Like what emotions should I have as I, as I kind of come into mastery with something? So we did a poll at Coreform and asked some of our hex meshing experts here, what emotion best describes for them the process of hex meshing apart? And there were a number of words that were shared, but we thought we could best represent this through emoticons. And these are generally the feelings expressed at core form with people that have made a career out of the hex meshing problem. Um, there's generally not a lot of, I mean, there's, what, what were the words, Greg? Distress. Um, anguish, pain. Anguish, pain. Hex meshing, it doesn't seem to be anyone's favorite part of creating a model for simulation. The re that's the reason the item wizard was created was to make this just a little bit better and so we're hoping by the end of this webinar, and then when you have the chance to get in the item wizard yourself, your emotions may switch from these to more of an, okay, I've got this. Um, and the, the hex mesh can be a tenable part of your modeling process. We just have, we can't go on before acknowledging that this pain is exactly why Coreform exists as a company and why we acquired Qubit. Uh, we're creating a new solver based on isogeometric analysis which really is, has been invented directly to address the issue of creating hex meshes. Um, once Coreform IGA is ready, hopefully later this year, then we expect the emotion surrounding this to switch even more to something like this, where hex meshing is just eliminated as, as a cause for consternation. So again, that's kind of our motivation as a company is to eliminate this pain and greatly accelerate and improve the, the workflow between CAD and simulation. But today, our goal is to just get you through for traditional modeling workflows. Um, so, so a little bit about Core from Qubit, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, it's a software that's been around for a few decades for advanced meshing for challenging simulations. Um, there's all sorts of strong uh, tools in the tool set from CAD import to the semi-automated hex meshing that we'll show you today. Many Qubit users rely heavily on Python and scripting. Again, we've added IGA pre-processing to the core from IGA solver. Um, and so if you haven't, if you're not familiar with Qubit, go ahead and grab a free trial on our website. Just a couple other plugs before we jump into the meat of the webinar and I hand off to Greg. Um, the uh, I, I, well, I first the learning objectives, if you go ahead, Greg, we're talking about four things today. First of all, the big picture, like to talking about like what shapes can be hex mesh, hex meshed. Uh, We'll go through some slides to explain that. Then when Greg goes into the live demo, we'll talk through the gotchas, some common issues that make hex meshing challenging. Uh, Greg will reference all of the powerful qubit hex meshing features, and then walk through the item wizard, which puts them all together in a nice straightforward workflow. An item um, will define once and for all today it means immersive topology environment for meshing. I will just call it the item wizard. Um, okay, so now just a couple other points. Uh, you can view all the webinars we've done in the past on YouTube. We do one or two a month. It's a useful um, repository. And then um, also just make you aware of Core from Qubit Learn. If you're in academia, it's a way to get Qubit in the hands of everyone for free. Uh, the only limitation is for non-commercial use, and there's a 50K element export limit. Okay, so this webinar is being recorded. Keep your questions coming in throughout the chat and the questions when no one will answer them back through the webinar. And with that, I'll hand it off to Greg. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, I'm uh, just excited to have seen where Qubit has come from, and I'm very excited for the future, as Matt mentioned, for things like Core from IGA and just continuous improvement even in our Qubit product. So what I thought I'd do today is just talk about hex meshing, you know, why is it so challenging? We saw those emoticons earlier, and so I just thought I'd talk about fundamentally the challenge and why maybe hex meshing is a bit different than tetrahedral meshing, which we may all be aware of. Um, we don't tend to have those same emotions around tet meshing because it seems to just work. And the reason why it just works is that 
with, when you're building a tet mesh, the only requirement is that you can build a bounding triangulation as shown on the left of your geometry. So if you can put a valid tri mesh down, there are then guaranteed algorithms that can build uh, tetrahedral meshes on the interior. Um, and those meshes, especially in particular when they're linear triangles, can have guaranteed minimum qualities. And so tet meshing really is just a matter of uh, uh, building a fine enough tri mesh so that you can put in a tet mesh and you, we oftentimes might call this tet bombing, where we're just throwing a lot of tetrahedral elements at a problem to solve it. There are issues in simulation, in particular for nonlinear analyses with tetrahedral meshes and nonlinear analyses in structural mechanics problems, that they tend to be really, they tend to be overly expensive and maybe challenging to converge to solutions. And so that's why hexahedral elements or hexahedral meshes are still in many cases preferred. So then the challenge, the corollary to that then is for hex meshing, if we have a bounding quadrangulation as shown here on the left, there are no known algorithms. In fact, we don't even know uh, mathematically if a quality hex mesh can even be produced on a given quadrangulation. And so because of this, um, hex meshing can't be fully automated like we can with text, and it requires a human in the loop to assist with identifying um, how to build a hex mesh. Um, and that's really the fundamental challenge. Challenge. It's an open mathematics question. But what we do have, and what tools like Qubit and other meshing codes um, have, is that they have found ways to build um, hex meshes on simple shapes and shapes that can be described with a recipe. So in the left case, we have a general shape. This is a, it's a cube with one of the corners cut out with a sphere, as you might see like on an interior pocket of a, uh, of a mechanical part that then maybe has fillets, you oftentimes will get this kind of shape. This is the polyhedron mesh scheme in Qubit, which really is just a bunch of simple mapped meshes that get arranged in a certain manner to fill in that certain CAD topology. In the middle, we have a sphere, and there's a sphere hex meshing scheme in Qubit, which again is really just a decomposition of a sphere into seven mapped mesh regions. Um, and that becomes the recipe for building a sphere mesh. And on the right is kind of the, the workhorse of Qubit, which is sweeping, which is where you start with um, surfaces, either one or more surfaces, that are then, they're meshed, and then they're swept layer by layer towards a target surface, and slowly adding in elements as you go. Um, and so really then what hex meshing is going to become, as we'll show, is, is the user trying to break their complex uh, CAD model into some arrangement of these simpler shapes that qubit or whatever meshing code they're using can recognize as hex meshable uh, individually. But also in order to do this, there's kind of like this larger algorithm that even as a, as a human, we need to be able to actually even see those shapes or get to those shapes. And so there's kind of this workflow that if you've done hex meshing before, if you talk to folks who've done hex meshing, really it becomes kind of like a, a process where you go back and forth. But we start by importing our geometry. There's oftentimes some challenges or some issues with that geometry. So we might need to do some healing of that geometry. Sometimes the healing, or sometimes the geometry is so broken that you have to actually go back to your original CAD application and maybe fix it there and then come back to healing. And then once you've got it sufficiently healed, you might then do some defeaturing so that you can get, so that it can be simple enough for you to eventually decompose it. And again, you might find some challenges during your defeaturing, which require you to go back to healing, which may require you to go back to the CAD application. Once you've got it defeatured, um, you may then start decomposing your geometry into those small, simple shapes that we have those rec recipes for. 
But as you're decomposing, you might find that, hey, that's a feature that I need to remove because it's too difficult for me to decompose. So I might go back to defeaturing and again, back and forth. And then finally, once you've decomposed it, you may go and you may build your mesh. And once you look at your mesh, you may decide, well, I could do some more decomposing to get higher quality meshing potentially. And so again, this process of cycling back and forth um, can occur. But this is generally at a high level um, for those of you who are new to hex meshing, kind of the general workflow that you'll use in building a hex mesh. Um, and this is kind of in regardless of whatever tool that you're using, uh, but certainly this, this is uh, common workflows in Qubit. So just to show what a couple of those steps mean, um, so this geometry is geometry defeaturing. If we have here a knuckle geometry, you can see that there are some small features like a small fillet here, as well as maybe a small face um, that uh, is just offset from this uh, cylinder and it's tangent to a curve here. And then we maybe also have some small features that maybe I don't really care about like these, there's a chamfer on these through holes and there's also a chamfer at this top. And so defeaturing here, what we're doing is we're essentially throwing up a white flag and saying, hey, those are gonna be too challenging for me to build a hex mesh on and I don't need them for my simulation uh, accuracy. So I'm going to remove those features wholesale. So I'm going to remove that fillet in the chamfers as well as remove this little interior face. Again, this process though is a manual process that takes some time. Because it takes time and human time, it also takes some it's also can be expensive and, some, and costly. Then the next big step, and this is where the simple recipes I talked about come into play, is that that whole geometry as a whole here on the right, it's not really a simple shape. I can't yet see, or the computer can't yet see, how to stack in these simple recipes. So what we do is we decompose this geometry into the smaller, simpler shapes that then Qubit can see how to how each of those shapes themselves fits a recipe. Um, in Qubit, we call the, the tools that we use to make these decompositions, we call those web cutting in Qubit. You'll also hear this called partitioning in some other codes. Um, but so then as you can see here, again, this is taking a human going through uh, either manually or with some tools to help them to find where those cuts are. And so again, that takes time, labor time, and takes money. And so any improvements we can make to these workflows that reduce the amount of time spent can save you um, or your company money. So now what I'd like to do is I'm gonna switch over to a live demo portion um, showing the item wizard um, inside of Qubit. Uh, and while I'm pulling this up, Matt, I might just ask if if any questions have come into the chat yet or not. Uh, no, you're good. All right. So I'm going to ask if people can see my Qubit um, application. I can. Yep. Okay. Good. So um, this is the Qubit. Um, um, meshing tool from Coreform. If you're not familiar with just kind of a general layout, we have a model tree here on the left, which will show us volumes as we're creating them. As we have things selected in our application, we'll have information shown up in this properties page. We have a command line um, interface uh, tool here on the bottom where we, every single command that's done in the GUI has an equivalent command in our Qubit command language. And you can track what those commands are that you've run by uh, down here in the bottom here, there's a history tab, which will show you a running log of those commands that you've run. And then there's also uh, from us from the, the default as Qubit ships, there's these panels here on the right, we have our command panel, which people who are experienced with Qubit will oftentimes use the command panel. Um, so it's kind of more, maybe more of an intermediate to an advanced user starts to shift over to the command panel. But there's also tabs down here for item and power tools. If you don't see these 
tools, or if you don't see anything on here, you can make sure to add them by going to the view uh, tab in the menu bar, and you can add or remove certain items. So for instance, I can remove the properties page by clicking on properties page and it's now gone away. And so if you had your screen open and you didn't have properties page, you'd want to come here and click on properties page. And likewise, if you didn't have item, if item was not uh, available for you, you would come into view and then it's a little wizard hat with a wand is the icon, but it says item. If we click on that, item will show up and we can then navigate that or make that the top item by clicking on its tab. So once you've seen this, um, or once you're in the item wizard, it kind of gives you a high level overview, which closely lines with the workflow that I showed previously. So this first little icon here, there are icons that go from top to bottom to kind of talk or walk you through the different steps of preparing your model. But they also are shown here as hyperlinks inside of the task description. So again, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to import, either import or create geometry natively, but in this webinar, we're going to just import CAD geometry. And it's walking you through kind of setting, setting up and preparing this model. Again, preparing being doing those healing operations, defeaturing, decomposing, and then we'll go on to meshing. Um, there are also some, oops, I've got a development build. So there's some links here that will bring you to the documentation in the production versions of Qubit, which will help you also understand the item wizard. Um, so we'll start by clicking on this first hyperlink to import or create geometry. And that then brings you to this next panel where we can choose to either open a pre-existing Qubit project, uh, maybe that uh, one of your colleagues has provided you, or that maybe you created um, earlier um, and you want to just restart. In our case, we're gonna import a CAD model from the file browser but again, you could also build your own geometry. So if we click on the import a CAD model, uh, while Qubit supports a lot of different CAD formats, here we're just showing a few of the CAD formats that are most common um, to Qubit. So for instance, we can import an ACES file, which is the native file for the, the geometry engine that Qubit is based on. But we also support uh, step import. So I'm going to import this item example geometry, which you can actually find in the tutorials for Qubit. And it's now imported for me this assembly of three components. Once I've finished importing my geometry, I can click on the little done hyperlink at the bottom right of my item wizard. And if I keep on clicking done through these steps, it brings me back to my task description and I'm ready to move on to the next stage. Um, now, this is a, a spot where if you wanted to get some initial kind of model sizing set up, you know, we typically have budgets for how big your computer is and how many elements you can have just from a performance standpoint. Um, we do support um, kind of setting your default again to tetrahedral meshing which for many applications is quite valid to use tetrahedral for. And you can even put in like your element budget for about how many elements you want to have in your model. So say if you wanted to go down the path of tetrahedral meshing, we could say maybe put in 100,000 elements and apply that. And it would apply the scheme to prepare for um, tetrahedral meshing. But again, I'm gonna switch back over to hexahedral as my um, default mesh scheme here. Um, so now we're going to go on to the next stage. So we kind of done some of that maybe initial prep work. We're going to prepare the geometry. Now this little um, task within here has a button to run diagnostics on these different kind of four key things to, to fix invalid topology, which might be something that that's where the healing aspect of Qubit would come in, but also to remove small features. Um, and then we'll also want to make sure that our volumes or our mesh is, is well connected and that we have meshable topologies. So I'm gonna to run the diagnostics here. 
And so as we can see, it's gone through and it's it said that these geometries are valid from a from a topology standpoint. So there's no need to heal this model. If we did need to heal this model, we would click on this hyperlink or fix invalid geometry, and we could run the analyzer and then fix any issues that occurred. But again, this model doesn't have any issues. So we move on to removing small features. And we could select either all of the volumes in our, in our model, or we could select just a few um, to then detect small features um, on. And so if I, um, if I uh, click on this, let's see, I might just want to here we go, find small features. And the small feature size here is maybe, uh, maybe 0.1. And so I can change my small feature size to 0.1 and then detect uh, small entities. And so now if I expand these found things, it will highlight in this case, I've got a small um, surface. So a small little fillet here that again, if I mesh this with hexes, you can imagine that to capture this really small fillet here, I'm gonna have to have a small element edge to capture this. And that could drive down my stable time step if I'm running an explicit dynamics analysis. And that may make my model too uh, expensive to run. And so I may decide that this is a fillet that maybe I don't care about. And so I'm okay removing this face. Um, so once we, if we select then one of those small surfaces in the small features window, it will, the item wizard will show us possible solutions that we can use. And if we want to just simply remove this fillet, the probably the best option for us to do, oh, excuse me, pardon me, um, is we can look at removing the surface. And if I just click on remove surface, we'll see a blue kind of outline shows up and is previewing what the geometry is going to look like if I apply that operation. And so what you can see, hopefully, is that we've gone from this fillet to now we're going to have a right angle show up. So it's kind of like we're just extending the neighboring surfaces to remove this fillet. And you know what? that's what I want to do here to remove this fillet. So I'm going to click on then execute. We can see now it's actually gone ahead and it's removed that fillet. I can then come back to my small features list and find another small surface. And if I look at this, maybe I don't see this. Maybe I'll click on a different one. I maybe don't see my whatever this small surface is. So I won't, um, maybe I'm curious about where this is located. If I right click on it, I can get options that show me I can do like a fly in, and it will fly me into this vert or to this small surface here. And again, so this is uh, uh, another small fillet that's going to drive down my stable time step for an analysis. And so I want to do that same operation of removing neighboring surface or removing the surface. I'll go ahead and execute that. And I'm just gonna make my graphics tolerance here. I'm just gonna make my graphics a little bit nicer here, just so it looks a little bit better for us. We would go to another surface here. And again, another, another small fillet. Now I could also, there are these small curves which we'll see that these small curves correlate again to these uh, surfaces. Um, but what I, what, you know, what I like to do is, it, is whenever you have a small curve, see if there are any surface operations. So in this case, you can see there's an operation to remove surfaces, even though I've selected a curve. And so if I then choose to remove this surface, right, and there's a couple of surfaces I could maybe choose. Sometimes it might say, if I select a certain option, that's going to have some error because that's maybe an invalid operation. So it's not perfect, but Cupid is trying to help identify maybe operations that we could do and we can select ones that work. So I'm going to select this remove surface 35, which should remove out this curve as well as a small surface. Um, yep. And then lastly, I've got again one small surface and some small curves. 
which I'm going to uh, remove as well. So Greg, there's a question from Ishak. He mentions there could uh -huh. be any number of small features. Um, it seems like manually checking and removing all of them could take a lot of time. Yeah, um, it certainly could. And that's, you know, going back to our, to our slide deck where we talk about that, uh, you know, this can be an expensive operation uh, to do this manual cleanup. Um, that's where, I mean, that is where there can be uh, some challenges. Um, now, what I'll say is that once as a user, as you, if, you know, as you become more proficient at Qubit, Qubit has a command language where what we can do is we can actually write, we can say, take these commands, like remove surface 18 extend, and we can start to now maybe do some logic where we can say, I want to select all of these small fillets. Um, so select these fillets um, in the, uh, using the command language and then remove all those fillets using the command language. Um, since that's more of an intermediate to advanced um, tool here, I'm not gonna talk about, we'll talk about that maybe in a future uh, webinar about using the command language um, and some of the advanced options in Qubit to accelerate that. But today I'm just gonna go in the wizard and the wizard is very much like a one operation at a time sort of uh, thing. Um, I wanna mention one more thing. So I increased my small curve length a little bit um, just so we can see maybe some false positives. Um, so one thing that Qubit's told me is that maybe there are some narrow surfaces. So Qubit has found that the that there's a, a narrow surface between these two uh, these two curves, um, as well as it's found me some small surfaces if I fly into them. It's saying, hey, this is a small surface, and what I can do as a user is I can actually right click and I can mark this as okay, and then a little green checkbox shows up next to the surface. And what I want to show is if we go back to this, if we click, if we were to click on done, we'd still have a, an, a red exclamation mark around remove small features saying, hey, I am still finding small features. And so what we can do is that as we um, come through, we decide that these are features that, yep, this is a feature that I also want to mark as okay. There's a small surface here. Let's see where this is. Uh, yep, you know what this, Maybe this is a mating surface with the next level assembly. I, even though I know it's small and it's going to drive a stable time step, I need to I need to still capture this, and so I'm going to mark this one as okay as well. Uh, again, those two narrow surfaces, we're we're showing up uh, here and then on the bottom of my geometry, and so I want to mark all. Maybe I just want to mark all of these narrow surfaces as okay, so I can mark all as okay. And then I've got these small curves. Because these curves were associated with either a narrow surface or a small surface, because I marked those as OK, they automatically get marked as OK. And so now, if I click Done, the Remove Small Features, the box here will switch to all green, it's OK, uh, because the small features I have said, yeah, they're small, but they're relevant uh, and small. So there's one, one more question. Why does it matter yeah. to identify small curves? Yeah, so what can um, sometimes happen, um, I'm gonna just create a, I'm gonna create a curve here just so you can see this, is it will oftentimes happen in, in CAD applications. Um, let me go vertex viz on so we can see the vertices. Is that you'll sometimes have a curve where maybe it has been split from some operation um, in the CAD application. So you might have a small curve like this. And if I were to say, again, I'm gonna use the command panel here just to prepare this example. Um, if I had, let's go like a size of one here. So if I had a really large element size that I wanted to have, the way that uh, Qubit and other thing, other tools that mesh CAD objects is they first mesh vertices and curves and they respect them. 
So because there is a vertex here highlighted right now, it's going to drive an element to be uh, a small element length, which can drive a small time step size. But it could also create kind of this skewed element that's maybe a poorer quality than I wanted. And so as we're going through in the wizard, by now it's like, or look for small edges, it'll find this small curve for me. And then it gives me these options of what I can do. I can maybe, you know, I can look at maybe like rebuilding the topology and that doesn't quite do right, the, this preview here. That's not what I want to do. That almost has added more curves. I could collapse some vertices perhaps. So if I click on, I need to delete this mesh first though. Um, so it'll allow me to collapse my, um, my vertex. So let's go execute this. And you can see now that small curve was essentially taken to a length of zero. So it kind of turned into like a, uh, it was like merged in with this other vertex. Um, but yeah, that's, that's why you want to remove small, uh, small curves. You want to remove curves that are smaller than you need for your analysis. Um, and uh, as well as small curves are oftentimes indicative of there being like a fillet. And fillets are notoriously difficult to build a hex mesh on. Um, they can be done, but if you have a hundred fillets in your model, um, if only one fillet matters, you want to remove the other 99 fillets that, that aren't important for your analysis and only have to worry about the one fillet. And that's why we're removing these. Yeah, that's a great question though. Is it, is it the radius or the length of the curve that, that matters? Um, for a fillet, it, it would be, I mean, the, the length would be equivalent, or not equivalent, but it would be proportional to the radius. But obviously, you know, a fillet is typically, a, you know, one quarter of a circle. But uh, we typically go by, the, by the, the curve length. But you are right. I mean, it, it tends to be just the fact that you even have a fillet at all. Um, that tends to be the issue um, with those. But again, generally you're gonna find fillets or usually they'll show up also as a small surface. Um, but if you have a really long fillet, it may not, but it, the curve then at least might. So it's not, a, it's not an exact science. So it, there is a bit of art to, it, uh, to this. So the next thing I wanna show is uh, this connect volumes. So here we're gonna do is I want to run a simulation where this is maybe like a, a steel header with maybe a pin on the inside of it or something, right? Um, and I want these to be joined. Um, and so we want these connected. But one thing we wanna do first is see if there's any gaps or overlaps in our model. And so I can click on detect this and it showed me that there's an overlap and it's given me a pair and which volumes are included. So again, if I click on the volumes, it'll show me those volumes highlighted. If I click on, or if I right click on the pair, I can then ask for it to draw the volume overlaps, which will give me this new kind of rendering. And here in red, it's drawn for me this overlapped region. And if I zoom way in, I can now see this overlapped region here. But maybe I'm a bit confused as what's going on here. So again, if I click on volume one, I can see, okay, so volume one comes up I'm kind of on this little stair step feature. And I can see, okay, so volume one's coming up to this red curve here at the top. If I click on volume three, I can see, okay, and it came down to here. And so if I kind of toggle quickly between them, you can now see what that overlap is. Um, I can reset my graphics. And now I'm zoomed in at this region and lo and behold, there is my overlap. So now I've got some options for how to fix this where I could maybe, you know, reduce a volume, you know, and this reduced volume doesn't maybe really seem to do what I want because it doesn't really seem to get rid of this overlap. I can also click on remove the overlap from the larger volume, which would be the green. And if I execute that, we can see now that that, that overlap has now disappeared. And if I do detect gaps and overlaps, there are none anymore. So now, um, we're going to go, I'm going to go to now imprint and merge. And so what this is going to do is 
if I look at the yellow volume and the green volume. So I want to have a conforming mesh, so a mesh that's joined at this interface. But if I draw this, there's no topology information on this yellow surface that there's a green, a green body nearby it. So it has no, it has no knowledge of there potentially being a neighbor. So what we need to do is we need to imprint and merge some volumes. Again, it's, it's found some volumes. I can change my merge tolerance if I wanted to. Um, and uh, I can then maybe click on a given pair. Let me refresh my display here. And again, I can draw the surface pair with the volumes if I want um, to see what these uh, volumes are. So this was this pair here between the purple and the yellow. Um, I've got a, and again, I can, uh, if I needed to have some um, smart fixing, I might do that. But otherwise, I can just click on imprint and merge for all of these things. But watch what happens now. If I do imprint and merge for these volumes, if I now look at this yellow volume here, I've now got some additional curves that, that are sharing the topology of that green of that green volume here. And that's important for making sure that my meshes align. Um, so if you don't, if you've forgotten imprint and merge, you'll have meshes that are disconnected from each other and you can't transmit stresses between them without using something like a tie, a tied constraint or a tied contact between them. Um, so now I'm done with this step. I'm going to now, um, you know, if I had contact, I could also identify these contact surfaces instead of doing imprint and merge, but we have no contact in this model. They're all imprints and merges. So I'm gonna click done. And now I'm moving on to building a meshable topology. Uh, so this is a, a nifty little tool. I really encourage this for new users to Qubit, or even if you're trying to learn about maybe some advanced mesh schemes, I've actually learned using this tool, I've found myself some, some neat little tricks. So if we click on check meshability, we'll get two lists of volumes that are either meshable or not meshable. So, um, and this is based on previously when we did our, our setup FEA model, we said we wanted to build a hex mesh. Again, if we had built, if we'd wanted a, a tetrahedral mesh, this, this geometry is already meshable for tets. But so I can click on volume one and I now have some options here for what I can do. I can maybe decompose this volume, that decomposition step we talked about. And so now this, again, the same list here, I've now got possible solutions that I can, um, I can click on one solution and then I can use my arrow keys to move up and down through the different solutions. And what we're seeing is for each of these, again, a blue surface, and we call this surface the web that's cutting, right? So this is why we call this web cuts because this blue surface is, uh, has been, was coined a web a long time ago by the Qubit uh, team. So maybe I want to apply this cut because I can see that it's going to cut along this inner radius. And that will make, you know, it'll give me like a kind of a, a hollow cylinder here and then a kind of a sweepable surface. So I'm going to go ahead and execute. And what we'll notice is now in our meshable volumes. So I've got now volume one. I've got this volume three. I've got this other now volume five. And those are all now meshable. Uh, volume two is still not meshable. So we're going to do, we're going to look through here to see how we can mesh this. So I'm going to click on the first solution here and see what I can do. Now, what I like to do is it's not always, I don't always have to take the first option because there's often more efficient um, ways to do this. Because maybe I can cut all three of these little um, appendages off at once. And so if I just cycle through these, Here's a cut that's going to sweep this surface down through. And so that will separate um, not just these three appendages but um, from the yellow volume, but also separate this kind of cylindrical region from this yellow, surf, uh, yellow volume. So that's the web cut I want to do. So I'm going to go ahead and execute that. 
And now what we see is that all of my meshes are now sweep or are now meshable. And if I don't believe it, I can always just re-click on check meshability and double check. And yep, everything is meshable. Um, sometimes a web cup might cut off a little bit too much and you might have to come back through and clean some stuff up by reuniting some geometries. Um, but now I'm done with this step. I can rerun my check diagnostics. And now Qubit's, Qubit has now said, hey, I found some small features. So we talked about like going back and forth. So I'm just gonna like double check what these small features might be. And again, this is based on the small curve length that I just picked of 0 0.5. Um, and so if I look at what these small curves are, I can fly in. And well, you know what, that's a curve, that's a small curve that I said I wanted in my model because I wanted to chop off this, uh, this, this gray surface. And so that's, that's a curve that I'm going to just live with. Um, that uh, if I want to capture this feature, I have to have it. And so again, I might mark, mark is okay. And I'm gonna presume that this is on the other side. Yep. And I'm gonna mark, this is okay. And I've got a, a few, again, small surfaces. And again, they're on those little appendages. So these are also all okay. And now we see that, right, now I'm all green. So if I'm all green, I'm ready to mesh. So I click done, and now I'm ready to mesh the geometry. And I can put in, I can just select all my meshes or all my volumes, and I can generate the mesh. And um, I can double check how many elements I have. There is a, a command line option to Actually, I think I can actually select these in this in the monitor here. Let me just see if it'll let me. Um, I guess, so I can right click and I can show quality, but I just wanted to see, let's see, uh, show, oh, list mesh info. And so I can see per, per volume, I can get some information about what mesh schemes might've been used. I think maybe it won't tell me how many elements I have. I guess if I do list totals, it will then list out for me how many elements I use. And so we can see here, I asked for 100,000 elements and I've hit right around 90,000 elements. So pretty good matching to my element budget that I asked for. So yeah, that's uh, so now we've built this mesh. Um, if I wanted to change off some of my mesh schemes, I can always select on a volume, um, and uh, if it hadn't meshed, I could choose a possible solution. I could go back stages and come back. Oops. Um, again, I've got a development build of Qubit, so my documentation is broken. But there are links that will help give you more information about what you can do. So I'm going to click on Done. Next, we might want to validate our mesh. And so I can define maybe the metrics I want or that I care about. So maybe I care about. Um, you know, the size of my elements, um, which is maybe important for uh, uh, like an explicit dynamics analysis. And I can check my quality on these volumes. And so it's gonna then show me here kind of, you know, my best elements, but also my worst elements here in red that I might want to look at um, from, a, from a quality standpoint. Um, I can go back to um, my quality metrics. If I'm doing like a statics analysis, like a nonlinear stat statics analysis, I then maybe care more about how good the Jacobian is because the scale Jacobian is going to tell me information about uh, how, if, how easily my Newton solver can converge to a problem or to solutions. So then I'm going to check this mesh quality with the scale Jacobian metric. And again, the red elements are my lowest quality. So kind of see this looks to be my lowest element, but it's telling me that based on my criteria, none of my elements were bad because my I have my minimum set to 0 0.5. Um, if you wanted to um, maybe refine your mesh in a certain location, there are options to refine a mesh and this will take you then over to our command panel. Um, 
You could also delete the mesh. Um, so Gary, there was a yeah. question that came in. If they wanted to just refine the, like say the yellow volume, if you turn off the... Um, yeah. Like how would you do that? Yeah, so like this yellow volume here. Um, so if we were to click on refine, so this will take us to this general refinement tool uh, in our command panel. And at this point, I could then click on this yellow volume here. And I could tell it how many iterations um, to split uh, split it with. Um, and there's some options I could choose. Like maybe a target size is what I want to do instead. Here, my size is probably around, if I select my, uh, I can select a little edge tool here, just select an element edge. Right, my length is right now about 0.45. So maybe I could, Maybe I could choose like a target size of 0 0.2. Um, and I could also do some post smoothing if I wanted by checking this box, but I'm not gonna worry about smoothing. So if I click on this, uh, oh, based, I guess we can't mesh or refine volume meshes up based on size. So maybe I'll just split, if I put this in by one, that'll give me from 0.45 to about 0.2. Um, Let's see. Depth option is. Uh, OK, so let's see. I need to add volume eight to my list. So I have to select multiple volumes, it's looking like, in order to do this. So I'll have to go through kind of this, probably have to operate on my entire model, it's, it's looking like. Is this because, um, you mer because you merged them? Yeah, it's because it's merged. And so refining, refining the yellow volume is going to require a refinement of the green volume and all, and all of its neighbors. Um, there are things you can do, like adding in like a sheet. Um, so I could add a sheet between a few nodes if I wanted to like refine a specific location. So there are multiple different options for doing this. That's probably why we said like this for volumes, maybe it's just to do all of those volumes with one iteration subdivision. Okay, but if you um, had if you had a solver that could take like non-conforming meshes, then they just wouldn't right. so just wouldn't yep. merge. Is that right? Right. Yep. If I if I was using a tool like Abacus that allows for tie constraint between the yellow and the green, and I didn't if, didn't need to have this conforming mesh here, then I could have just refined the yellow. Yep. But uh, this is one of the gotchas with hex meshing is that because those hex meshes, if we saw in the PowerPoint earlier. Because these job, these mesh schemes, you can see that they all natively have structure behind them. So hex meshing is really, there's all, even this swept mesh, there's a structure, right? It's, it's structured in this sweep direction. You tend to get these refinements that then propagate throughout the geometry. Um, so that's just a, that's why you can, you tend to see that. And that's, you know, once one of the benefits with, tet, with tetrahedral elements is that they're, them being natively unstructured kind of sets them up for being able to do local refinement a bit more easily than hex meshes do. Um, yeah, so I just wanna just touch, finish up here. That So I've, I've validated my mesh. We have some options to set boundary conditions. Um, and Qubit is, while it does have an option for materials and other boundary conditions, Qubit really is meant for is preparing certain surfaces or geometric entities for then a code to, like advocates that uses sets as its definition. So I might make a node set that maybe is my, uh, um, maybe I want like a reference point. Oops, so like a node set one, I might call this reference point. And I might select a, a vertex on my CAD geometry. So I might select like this CAD geometry here, and then that will automatically pull any nodes that are associated with that when I export. Um, I can select side sets, which might be what I do a pressure on. Um, or maybe, or the code might let me do like a, like a zero displacement boundary condition. So I might create something here. Maybe I'll call this X min. And I'll select maybe these X min surfaces by using control and clicking to select multiple surfaces. So for this quarter symmetry model, I want to apply a symmetry boundary condition here. And so my model tree I can now see that these items have been getting created. Uh, for time, I'm going to skip doing the Y max, but I'm going to come back and I can now define blocks 
which might be for my, my materials. So maybe I've got block one and it's gonna be called this pin. And it's gonna be these two volumes here that I had, had that originally had been green. In another volume, I'm gonna maybe call it, just call this like gasket. And it's this purple volume. And then a third block that's gonna be the, these, remaining, these remaining volumes. And again, I see those in my model tree. Oops. Um, oops. So I fat fingered something. There we go. Apply. Oh, and I gave it the wrong name. That's what I did. I got the name wrong. So let's just rename this to header. And so now in the item wizard, I'm done assigning my boundary conditions and I'm now ready to export my mesh to any of these formats that Qubit supports. So the native Genesis file format, which is another name for Exodus, which is the Sandia mesh format that's open source and codes like Moose, the open source Moose applicator or code uses Genesis and Exodus. We want to export to Abacus or Ideas, Nastran, Patran, or Elastina. And so I could choose to export one of these files and save it somewhere. And that's really using the item wizard. Um, and uh, so let's just go back to my slideshow now, unless there's any questions. Um, yeah, there, there are a few. Go ahead and just finish up your slide because we've got yeah. just five minutes and we can yep. have some questions. So I wanna, yeah. So what I wanna say is I encourage you, you know, if, as you move forward with trying to master hex meshing, there's a few steps that you can do. You can download the free trial of Qubit. Um, we also mentioned the Qubit Learn as well. Uh, but you can sign up for your free trial here, which doesn't have any limitation on mesh export, but it's a 30-day trial. Again, there's also the Qubit Learn, which is limited on export, but no limit on, or it's not a 30-day limitation. We also have our tutorials on our webpage um, that you can walk through. And I really encourage going through the Qubit 100 and 200 lectures here. Um, these are really good lectures that Sandia put together. And you can also join our user forum and ask questions here and um, get really responsive um, answers from the Qubit team and a lot of people with a lot of experience hex meshing. Yeah, and so now I'll go ahead and open up to questions. Okay. Well, great. First, thanks again. You do an excellent job on these and thanks for the time you took to master this and then to share it today. Yeah. Um, okay, here's a question from Ibrahim. How can you use hex 20 and how much would using hex 20 reduce the number of total elements? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the way that Qubit works is that, um, again, Qubit was, ba was based on codes being developed at the US Department of Energy National Laboratories. And they use this kind of logic called blocks, where in their codes, a block is what they assigned a material formulation to and an element formulation onto. And so once you create a block in the properties page, the block will have an element type based on if you've meshed it with like a like a, maybe a surface with quads, it will default to like a shell. Um, um, if you meshed it with tets, it'll default to like a tet four. We always default to the to linear elements just for speed. But if you click in this element type here, you'll then be presented with all these different element types that you can choose. And you'll notice here that there are these element types correspond to the Exodus mesh format, which you can find on GitHub, you can find documentation. I believe that their elements are compatible to Patran. So I believe that Exodus uses the exact same orientations and formations as Patran does. And so here we can find a hex 20. And so I could, if I redraw my mesh now, um, let me actually uh, delete mesh. Let me do a, a coarser mesh here. Uh, so we can see this more clearly. Oops, that's too fine. We want it a bit, a bit bigger. Delete mesh. Ball all size five. Mesh ball all. Oh, might need to reset those volumes in. I think the item wizard is um, ball all size. One mesh fall all. Here we go. So this is a really coarse mesh here, but what we'll see is with this block, 
if I do like the header, if I change this to hex 20, um, you'll notice that the fastening gets a little bit finer. I can also draw node all, and you can now see these additional mid, mid nodes showing up on my elements. Um, now, as far as how much that reduces the total number of elements, that's really simulation specific. And um, you know, all that qubit does is it just builds the mesh. But what I recommend that all analysts do, I mean, you know, higher order elements do, do converge at faster rates than linear elements. Um, so if you can afford to do that, that can oftentimes be a good option. Um, in some analyses, especially like explicit dynamics analyses, there's no real, there may not be a benefit to doing higher order elements because it cuts your time step down and you get some uh, robustness issues with regards to inverting elements that kind of have made linear hexes just the, the, the go-to for uh, explicit dynamics analyses. But you can find that these higher order hexes can be pretty good for your, um, uh, for reducing your element count. Um, and they are more they are more efficient per degree of freedom, which is really what matters, more so than the number of elements. But yeah, that's a great question. Um, and uh, we're we're uh, we're looking to make sure that we can add more support for more element types as well. Um, so I think in in future releases of Qubit, you know, it may may not be immediate releases, but I think we'll see more options for what are available here. But that's where today you would change those element formulations. Okay, Craig, I think we've got time for one last simple question. Okay. What's the difference between a side set and a node set? Yeah, that's also a great question. So let me, uh, let me make it even clearer. What I'll do is we previously created, um, let's now delete mesh uh, ball all size 0.25, just so we can see this. If I create a side, uh, a node set on this other face, let's create a node set here um, and call this Y max on these surfaces. What you'll see is that the node set is really just the nodes. And so oftentimes like boundary conditions are oftentimes just applied on nodes. They're just nodal degrees of freedom. And so all that you need to have out is what is the node ID inside of a boundary condition. What a side set gives you is for things like pressures that you're applying, you oftentimes need to have like the area of the element upon which to integrate a pressure. And so side set, if we zoom in, it contains the topology of those faces. And so it not only contains the nodes, but also you know, the element that they are corresponding to and their orientation. And then you can compute their size and Jacobians on that face. So you can do stuff like integrate a pressure over them. Um, oftentimes, a lot of codes will treat node sets and side sets effectively equivalent when it comes to like boundary conditions. Um, so often, oftentimes, a lot of users will just use side sets for everything because if they ever want to come back and apply a pressure, they don't have to redefine a node set as a side set. Um, so what I find node sets most useful for in my own workflows is I, again, use side sets for all my load conditions and boundary conditions. I will use node sets for, I want to track the displacement of a single node, maybe throughout my simulation. And I want to maybe track convergence of that node as I refine my mesh. And that's what I personally use node sets for, is that they just become an output set for myself. So in this case, maybe I just want to track the displacement of this node. Um, but th that is, it's a subtle, subtle how they're different. But um, if you want to apply pressures or integrated conditions, you'll need to have a side set. Great. So. Okay. Well, great. Thank you again. Thanks everyone for taking an hour to attend today and hope everyone has a great day. Yep. Thank you everyone.